And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. It was 1776 when the founders signed the writ of independence from the Brits. It was revolution. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd, I'd like to welcome you to another program of Connecting the Dots. And tonight we are having a, a couple of guests on our program that I think are very, very important uh, to understanding what is happening in the western United States, what's happening to our our rural uh, ranching and farming communities. And uh, the, the, tonight's program will be a discussion about the uh, death of uh, Lavoie Finnegan at the uh, uh, tra so-called traffic stop uh, in uh, just outside of Burns, Oregon, and uh, how that whole event came to be, and also inside information from someone who was riding in the vehicle and actually saw the entire thing happen, and not only saw it, that actually filmed the entire event on her cell phone camera. And uh, the evidence is pretty overwhelming that it isn't quite uh, what was advertised uh, by the uh, uh, federal government. But with that said, I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, guest for today's uh, program. Uh, Brand Thornton is a gentleman that we had on last week. Brand has been involved in this uh, in this conflict uh, for a very uh, long period of time. He's been involved with the uh, uh, Bundy, uh, Bunkerville, uh, the standoff there, and then later in uh, in Oregon with the uh, Malhauer uh, Wildlife uh, Refuge. But uh, the, the lady who is on with Brand, who is really uh, very knowledgeable about this whole thing, is Sh uh, Shauna Cox. And Shauna has actually been involved uh, even before Bunkerville happened. Uh, she was one of the founders of the uh, Utah-Arizona Tea Party, and she was actually um, and knew the Bundy fan family before the events that happened outside of Bunkerville and has quite a long uh, history and story about uh, how much of this stuff happened. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, uh, start the conversation by um, uh, Shauna. Would you like to give us a little bit of your background? I I uh, would also ask uh, Brand to do the same thing. He was on last week, but uh, maybe didn't have quite as good an opportunity to uh, uh, talk about some of his experiences we would have liked, so we're going to do it tonight. So, uh, Shauna, would you uh, kind of tell us a little bit about your background and how you first became involved with this whole situation? Oh, sure, I'd love to. Um, I became aware of things that were happening because of, in our community, we had a, a monument that was being placed upon us, the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument was brought in to, um, well, signed in to a monument by uh, President Clinton at that time, and I was really involved with that. And so that's kind of um, when I very first met Cliven, because he was, he came over to help us, and we had formed a, a, some c committees and things to help stand up uh, trying to fight the federal government from taking over our homes and our land and our ranches and our roads. So I've been totally involved in that for years when Cliven had his problems. Then I had a tea party organized, and he called to ha have us come and help him there. It actually started about two years before that. They were going to come and uh, try to take away his um, his cattle and take over his ranch. And um, we were able to stop that just after midnight, uh, before 6 o'clock the next morning. And then two years almost to the day, they did it again. So that was my first experience with this. And I have a lot of children. 
and uh, have been really involved in my community and the schools and uh, and so I was really aware of things that were happening and I and I just knew that we had to stop this uh, tyrannical government that was what was really scaring us and so I went out to the ranch when Cliven called me just to check things out and see what we could do to help and that's where my story began with him Okay, um, good. Did um, when when you got started with this uh, uh, problem with the uh, Escalante uh, National um, what did I guess? the Grand Staircase? Yes, Grand the Grand Staircase. Staircase. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, what was uh, the, the, a lot of the ranch lands and a lot of the uh, stuff in that area was really involved in that uh, in a way that a lot of people are not aware of. Can you kind of give a really quick background on on how it affected uh, ranching and so forth, and then maybe we can talk quickly about uh, the Bundy situation, because I know there were a bunch of ranchers in that area that had been put out of business and literally lost all their grazing rights, and um, Cliven was the last guy in the area that was standing up, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. In Utah, just as you cross the border from the Arizona into the Utah border, my friend Mary Rucker um, was the one that was the first rancher there, and they went after her mercilessly, uh, trying to take all the ranchers out, and they were they would go after them one at a time, and she had she had been widowed less than a year. And I think they thought she was an easy takedown, but she's a little fighter, and she was not going to give up easily. And they did everything they could. And they were using the BLM, and uh, and they were working together with the environmental groups. And the environmental the environmental group that was working with them was the Grand Staircase was a, was sorry was um, the Grand Canyon Trust Company. And I didn't even know, understand who they were at that time. But as it as it developed, we saw how they were manipulating with the politicians to get people off the land. And that's when I learned about Agenda 21. And that was a major uh, eye opening to me of what they were, what their agenda was. And from there. Uh, I just knew what they were happening because as each rancher, they would try to take them out. And I was able to get them, the other ranchers, engaged because um, helping them to understand, that's why we created the Tea Party, was helping them to understand what the dangers were of them becoming individually persecuted and prosecuted so that they would lose all of their rights. So. During that same period of time, they were hammering on the ones there in Clark County, and they did take out, oh, since the 70s they've been working on them, but they did take out in 1993, they began to change their contracts with the people, with the ranchers, and in Clark County, eventually it took them a few years, but they were able to put, there was 52 ranchers, and every one of them were out of well, 53, including Cliven, and all 52 of the others were put out of business because of the restrictions and regulations that the BLM placed upon them and had them sign in these contracts. Cliven and his friend uh, Keith May, who was also a rancher there, were um, understanding what the problem was and decided that they needed to not sign the contract. If they didn't sign the contract, they were under no obligation to allow the BLM to do the, to restrict them and their use of their uh, rights of water rights and their land and, and um, the forage. So they they got the picture and they understood and they were trying to educate others and that's when they came and also tried to help educate us. But when they got when he got in trouble, uh, Mr. Nay had already passed away. And Cliven was kind of standing on his own, and he was begging for help. And that's that's where that began. And at the Bundy Ranch, when I got there, 
Cliven had never left his ranch. He was restricted from entering any of the public land by a federal judge. And she sent, and that judge sent an enforcement. Um, I call them a federal army of BLM people. There was Park Service, Forest Service, and hired mercenaries in that group. And they came onto the state public land and put up clothes signs to keep all the public off. They set up corrals and called them free speech areas. And, and you know, you well know as well as I do that free speech is not an area. Right, exactly. Well, I know that um you know, this is a good background so that we can uh we can kind of fit how uh Lavoy Finnicum uh came to be part of that group because it's my understanding that uh Lavoy was also one of three ranchers that were really standing up and saying enough is enough. Right. And he learned that from that from Cliven's ranch. When he came out and Cliven asked for help, Lavoy showed up with his horse. He he knew uh he began to his eyes were beginning to open and he, he understood what was at risk. And the more he studied, the stronger he became. He was really convicted. And it was a it was a learning process. But he got it and he was willing to make the stand. Well, I kind of um, I, I watched a couple of videos uh, with Lavoy uh, talking in there. I also read his book, and uh, uh, it was pretty easy for me to understand uh, why he would uh, represent a threat to uh, bureaucrats uh, in the various land agencies. And incidentally, your comment about 1993, it's, it's interesting because that is the same year that uh, uh, President Clinton started initiating a lot of the uh, so-called sustainability aspects of uh, UN Agenda 21. And um, UN Agenda 21 had come into being only the year before, uh, and it had been <coughs> signed in. Uh, signed by the president, not uh, signed into law, but signed by uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush, who was uh, president at the uh, Rio summit that initiated UN Agenda 21. So there's a lot uh, going on in this time frame. In the early 90s uh, is when we really started to see them uh, turn the pressure up on a lot of this stuff. So I'm glad you mentioned that. So uh, let's move uh, fast forward a little bit. And, uh, Brand, I'd like to maybe uh, get get you in into the conversation as well. But let's fast forward to the um, Malhauer uh, uh, area. The Malheur? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and talk about that and how that whole thing came into – uh, into play and how there wasn't uh, any intention by the ranchers that were occupying uh, Ammon, uh, any of the other ranchers there to create any kind of a violent scenario. It was a very peaceful protest, and I, I'd like you to kind of talk about that, uh, Brand, and also Shauna, if you would, please. Okay. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, I'm one of the original, uh, I hate to use the word, Occupiers, but I was one of the original occupiers that uh, went into the refuge. Um, that particular day, we had the protest, and uh, I was in the Safeway parking lot, and uh, <clears throat> I got a message that I was to go to a meeting, and uh, there was a little, right there next to the parking lot, was a little cafe, and I went in there, and I heard the uh, the idea that Ammon had, and it sounded really good to me, and so. I decided to be involved with that, and uh, so uh, we took off uh, during the during the protest, during the middle of the protest, a certain bunch of it took off in uh, you know a caravan. We headed out to the to the refuge, and uh, when we got there, um, it was there was nobody there, and the doors were open, and the lights were on, and the heat was on, and you know we just went in and uh, uh, you know had a peaceful assembly. And uh, the whole idea was just to bring attention to these land issues, and especially Dwight and Stephen Hammond and what had taken place with them, the egregious laws that had been broken with them. And uh, it was a very short time after that. We had all kinds of news media out there, and uh, 
it was actually it was amazing the number of people that we had out there. We literally ended up having a few thousand people, uh, primarily ranchers, uh, that um, came out and uh, there was a teaching program put on by Ammon and, and Ryan and even uh, Shauna there and some others, uh, educating them to their rights. And what had what has been taking place over the years as far as the abuses um, with that uh, the Malheur Refuge there, and because there used to be something like 130 ranchers there that had been displaced to form this refuge. Now you now you stop and think of 130 ranchers. How many how many people per ranch uh, in, in each ranch? You know you're looking at I would say at least five people. So you know you're pushing 500 to 1,000 people that had had their rights taken away, had their lives destroyed, had been displaced, and whatever happened to those people, whatever happened to their their descendants. Well, that was one of the plans, you know, that uh, Shauna was actually heavily involved with, is unraveling uh, what had happened to these to these people and their property, and trying to, uh, you know, bring them back and uh, give them the opportunity to uh, make claims on those properties that had been stolen from them. And uh, so that was the whole idea. It was very, very peaceful. We went out of our way to make sure everybody understood it was peaceful. Uh, everybody was welcome. Uh, like I said, we had literally a few thousand people come through there. And every media outlet, even the ones that lied to their teeth, we allowed to go down and, and uh, to interview people. You know, transparency, we couldn't have done a better job. It's like Amazon's always said, um, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And we wanted to be transparent. We were transparent. Mm -hmm. We were peaceful. Well, I think that's, uh, I, you know, I grew up in uh, a ranching and farming uh, community and in that environment. And uh, I, you know, frankly, uh, seeing the uh, the Bundys, the Hammonds, they remind me so much of uh, people that were, were and still are my neighbors. And uh, these aren't people that are violent, nasty people, but they are people that uh, after a while you can push them so far, you can push them up against against the wall, and sooner or later you're going to have somebody that's uh, uh, going to start fighting back. And the way these guys were fighting back was trying to do it legally by understanding uh, that the Constitution and our law system was being violated by the very people that are supposed to be protecting and defending those rights. Absolutely. You're so right. These these ranchers, you know, anytime you think that a rancher stands up to fight about anything, they're land people. They are peaceful. They're hard workers. They work from sun up to sun down, and and they don't get involved in those types of things very often. So when you have a bunch of ranchers that are really uh, protesting something, it must be major. People should pay attention to those things because. They're not those type type of people. They are really um, hardworking people. They work daylight to dark, and then they they're tired. They sleep through the night, you know. <laughs> well, and the thing is, is most of those same people, those same families, are the first ones to uh, uh, come to the help or the aid of uh, anybody that needs uh, that has an emergency or has any kind of a family uh, emergency. They're the first ones to be there. To try to help, and uh, absolutely, always been the case. Always been the case. And so, another thing anyway, too. Let, let's talk about uh, Mal, uh, the the the, uh, the refuge and the uh, uh, some of the folks that were there because this thing started off very definitely as a, as a very peaceful, uh, just a protest against the uh, which obviously to me looked like double jeopardy of. Uh, the uh, Hammond family, the fact that they had uh, served time and then someone else came in, another uh, another uh, judge came in and completely uh, changed the original verdict to be something totally different and to add four and a half or four years to their uh, prison sentences. And frankly, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. So I, I guess that's a little editorializing on my part, but um, tell us about how the uh, came in from outside of the group that was there that were brought in by 
the FBI and various uh, law enforcement agencies how they came into the picture and how they really tried to create a lot more uh, strife and uh, militarization than the uh, ranchers really wanted. Well, we still don't know who they all were. Um, but, uh, you know, at one time there was 15 informants there out of, say, 40 people. So, you know, they had a, a, a strong influence in uh, trying to shape the narrative there. And, you know, as agent provocateurs, uh, I've seen a few of them when I first got there. They're the ones that broke into one of the buildings and uh, ransacked the safe. And uh, they tried to set Ammon up with that whole thing. And then, of course, you know, we found out about uh, the, the others, Terry Linnell and Fabio Menaggio, who went by the name of uh, John Kilman. And uh, <clears throat> John Kilman, uh, he was, I believe, uh, more than just teaching and training and shooting and carrying on these uh, these uh, shooting events, but I think he also brought a lot of a lot of the firearms out. Now, uh, and towards the end of that whole thing, uh, they had these two Navy SEAL people that came in and they kicked in some of the doors. and And I am absolutely convinced that they brought in the thirty thirty something uh, firearms that was paraded before the jury up in, in you know in the court up there in Oregon. Now, if anybody looks at those pictures of those firearms and they know anything about firearms, those are primarily Woodstock FKS rifles. Now, I was up there for, at that refuge and got to meet everybody pretty much, you know, daily. And all the time I was there, I did not see one of those firearms there. Those were obviously, obviously brought in. And, uh, and I'm going to say brought in by Fabio Menaggio and also the two uh, other agent provocateurs who came in claiming that they, they were Navy SEALs. So <clears throat> here you go. You know, they tainted this whole thing. You know, if it's a conspiracy, well, they put, they played a big major part of that conspiracy. In fact, they're the only ones that were conspiring against anybody was them and the federal government. So uh, that's a big, you know, if I, I hope I outline, you know, closely what you're, what you're looking for as far as those informants are. Well, well here, let me tell you. Sorry. No, that's okay. I, I was just going to say that if, uh, ran first of all, ranchers, uh, I never met a rancher in my life that would have an SKS. Um, <laughs> if, if in fact, uh, ranchers brought in uh, firearms, it would be Remington, Winchester, Savage. They may bring in a uh, an AR, uh, but it certainly wouldn't be an SKS. No, there weren't. Well, there were no illegal guns on there. Um, but one of the things that that I wanted to say was we are learning who uh, these undercover agents were. We're getting a pretty good handle on it. Um, but the thing is, is it was it's sad because there was never an intent to do anything evil, and so. We wanted everybody to come, and we invited them. We went out into the public and invited them to come and made friends with people, and that's why they came down, and they brought food, and, and they knew that there was peace and loving there and, and that we were there to help them, and it, it began to get bigger and bigger. And then after we, we were arrested is when I finally found out, well, I, I knew a lot of things that were happening because of the, the records that we were able to, um, let's see, what well, we saw, okay? So anyway, um, because of the things that we found there and the persecutions of these ranchers, we kind of were able to go back to where this is, this um, tyranny is coming from. I, I have to call it tyranny because it really is. It's a conspiracy it against yeah. American people. And... It was really upsetting to me to discover that the same judge that Bill Clinton appointed to in place of Judge Hogan, who originally had sentenced the Hammonds to go to prison, and then he appoints this other one, uh, Ann Aiken. She is the one that has financial interest in the Malheur. She has two sons that are on the 
friends of the Mallier board who were there out there protesting against us. They were raising money for the Mallier for every single day that we were there. Um, they So there's a lot of people that are financially have a lot to gain because of the Mallier itself and the minerals that are on it. And that's wow. what was so uh, – and, and she seems to be – I mean, not seems to be. She was uh, – the same one who indicted us at um, in, at the federal prison when we were uh, arrested originally. Uh, you know, that's an interesting thing that I really want to get into is what exactly were the charges uh, of, of the, uh, the defendants at the trial in Oregon? What were actually the charges and what charges are still out there? Well, it, we all were cha- charged with the same thing. The original charge, which we didn't know, by the way, uh, when they arrested us, there had there wasn't a warrant. Um, they it took them hours to figure out what they were going to charge us with, and that and the charges came out to uh, conspiracy to impede a federal officer by force, threat, and intimidation. And I looked at them and said. What are you talking about? I said I never even saw any officer till after they shot at me. I, I had no idea how how would we impede them, and and none of the other people. I don't even understand what they were talking about. But they that was the closest thing they could come up with that could be a federal c- crime is conspiracy. And anybody who speaks to each other that you know that could commit a crime would be uh, a conspiracy. So any two people can conspire, and then it was like everybody else could join at any time, would be part of that conspiracy, and it's so broad that you could charge anybody with anything and try to make it stick, and that's what they were trying to do. And And even even the second go around is the same. And even if if you didn't didn't even know about it, right. Yeah. So we were really being tried terribly for an outrageous kind of a charge, but that's the only way they could get us into a federal court. And they're still trying to push that with this second go-around, but they've now changed the charges. As of today, I learned that they have changed. They didn't change the charge. The charges are still the same. They just added a bunch more misdemeanors to those say the last seven people but because they couldn't push the uh, conspiracy charge because we were all uh, you know found not guilty of that which by the way if you have 12 people find you not guilty then it means we're innocent there's a big difference between that and people need to understand that there's a difference between being not guilty and innocent and they have no jurisdiction over us that way uh so what happens is, and then, but they have found one man that they're trying to throw a whole bunch of federal charges against, which are terribly um, not founded, and we are, have to take that down. So one of our, one of the guys there, they're trying to uh, throw everything at now because they didn't get Ammon and Ryan or those guys. So who's we the, still have who's a battle. The one that they're working on now that they're trying to. Uh, trying to take down the one. That's that's one. Dwayne Emmer. Okay. He's yeah, and he's a he is a honorably discharged from the Marines, and mm-hmm. they are. It's a very sad deal. But he was the one that was riding the horse, uh, Hellboy, and carrying American flags. Uh, yeah. Pretty much daily when we're there. Let me say something about conspiracy charges. You got to go through a lot of mental gymnastics to be able to make that stick. And basically all it is is thought control. Now, for them to continue this conspiracy charge, in my opinion, very strong opinion, this is double jeopardy. Because, you know, this trial, even though it was broken up into two trials, it was basically the same trial, all Mm -hmm. right? Now, the, the jury has come back and said, not guilty on conspiracy. And yet they're gonna charge seven more people with that same crime, that is double jeopardy. In my opinion, that is double jeopardy. It's already been adjudicated. And, and for them to bring it back just shows just how dishonest and, and disgraceful 
this judge and, and these prosecutors are. Well, it, it kind of sounds to me like they're going to uh, continue to try to do this, It's uh, and it's been the case uh, a lot of times in federal courts. If they don't get the, they don't like the outcome of the uh, first trial, they'll uh, uh, try to figure out a way to continue it so that they can get a new jury, and uh, they figure if they do it enough times that eventually they'll come up with a jury that uh, – that votes the way they like. And this jury pool that they're drawn from is, it has already been painted, all right, because you have the, 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 the district attorney out there, you have, um, <clears throat> I forget all the people, but Anna, uh, uh, Kate Brown uh, and others have come out and spoken how disappointed they were with that verdict, okay? That's been all over the news. That's been all over the news. Mm-hmm. And uh, they have, you know, prejudice. That they have prejudice in the jury pool, as we now speak. And so, how are these men, you know, going to get a, be able to get a free trial? When and and it's a very liberal state in the first place. And a lot of people were upset with the twelve jurors. In fact, the the, the media outlet wanted their names put out there. Well, I know why they wanted to put them out there. They wanted to give them tarred and feathered. So now, look what's happening. You're going to bring in some other people from a very liberal state that know that the politicians and the judges and the prosecuting attorneys are all very upset. That is, they're not going to get a free trial. I just don't see it. Well, let's hope that the uh, new administration puts an end to this, and that's uh, that's a hope that I have because uh, – uh, this this whole thing is a travesty. But um, let's get on to uh, the uh, the uh, convoy and the travel from the uh, from the refuge there, uh, and how that was all put together, and the timing and and the vehicles and so forth. And then uh, let's talk about how. Uh, ultimately, uh, Shauna, you were in the vehicle that Lavoy was driving, and I've seen the video of uh, that entire thing, and it's very compelling. Um, and I would suggest that our listeners go to uh, our website where we've got our, uh, uh, we call it our billboard and descriptor for this week's show. And at the bottom uh, of my description of what we're talking about, there's a uh, a video that's called Lavoie Assassination Forensic Proof. Um, I suggest that our uh, listeners uh, go to that site and click on that video. It's about an hour long, but it's uh, in, in incredibly compelling. And uh, Shauna, would you like to kind of uh, talk about how, first of all, how this convoy, how what what you were doing with the convoy, why you were going to. Uh, 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 meet with the sheriff and uh, how this whole thing was put together and then we'll start talking about the events that led to uh, the shooting death of Lavoy Pennicum. Oh sure I'd be happy to um, we that well the meeting came about because there was a, a rancher well I don't know if he's a rancher but one of the men over in John Day he lives in, in Grant County and he had been burned out. His timber had been destroyed, and, and it's all from these fires that this BLM sets in. They don't help put them out. And and uh, the, his home had been destroyed, and he was really came one of those sad tales that needed help. And he wanted us to come to Grant County. And the, he knew, and we knew, that their sheriff uh, was a constitutional sheriff and that he was – there to help protect the citizens. They asked us to come, and he actually set up the meeting, and we were going to, uh, the truth is, I wasn't going to be there, because we never always went together to any meetings. There were different people. We all had different things that we were volunteered to do. But the Sharp family was going to go sing, and that was the women with all the young children and their gospel singers. So, when they set the meeting up that day, it was set up that um, we would travel, that they would travel in a convoy, but it would be separated so that if anything would happen to one, that 
the other one would be 10 minutes behind, just for safety purposes. So they set out, and the Committee of Safety from Harney County left first in their vehicle, and then we had uh, the ranchers out of uh, Wyoming that were going to go, and I think there were some legislatures, and then we had the Sharp family with uh, with all her children in the van, and they went 10 minutes later, and then it was LaVoy's truck, and then it was supposed to be uh, a reporter, uh, one of the a media man that was going, and then we had uh, Ammon and the Jeep, and that's how it was supposed to go down. At the end, it didn't work out quite like that. Uh, when it was time for the Sharp family to leave, they were a little bit behind because they had all these children uh, that were... Um, you know, getting ready, but they weren't quite ready. And mm-hmm. and so uh, I went over to help them get ready. And there was another person that was supposed to go and videotape the family and the meeting. It was David. And, and he wasn't there. And I was trying to hurry and get those kids into that van and get them out. And so the little guy wasn't with us. He was He was he had gone down to the bunkhouse and Somebody ran and got him and, and the older daughter who had just showed up the night before, Victoria. She's 18, and she was still in the shower. So they had to leave her because Mark McConnell was trying to get them to hurry up and get out of there. He gassed them up. He was yelling at them, and, and it really upset the family because he was swearing, and the mom was upset about that. And um, so they took off without Victoria. So the next vehicle to leave was Lavoie's, and she jumped in the back seat with him and I jumped in right behind her because we couldn't find David and when the 10 minutes was up and we were trying to get out. So I just put all my stuff in my car, locked it and jumped in the car and brought my camera. And that's what I used to um, record that with. And we got, and that's when we um, were ambushed about 30 minutes later on the highway and I pulled out my camera and videotaped it. So I lost do, do you think that uh, Lavoy and Ammon were uh, going to be specifically targeted? I know that uh, Mark uh, uh, McConnell, McConnell was uh, in the uh, uh, vehicle that Ammon was in, and he was he is later been identified as one of the operatives for the FBI that was uh, uh, you know part of their uh inside people uh so do do you you know by the way this whole thing happened uh everybody got through except the last two vehicles uh well it would have been three if the reporter had been um uh, on on board and been ready to go uh but the last two vehicles are the ones that really got um i i guess stopped and and the whole thing was set up for am i right on that you are. Uh, the last vehicle did come, and uh, was and we were stopped in between. He, they, they weren't. St- he wasn't stopped. I mean, he was because the roadblock was there by then. They had blocked the road. Um, and yes, we we knew that somebody had to have informed them when we came, because they knew exactly, and our the timing was so perfect as when to to uh, come and to have McConnell right behind us was uh not supposed to be that way and it and it did so they knew when we were coming. The only thing they didn't know was that Victoria and I were in that vehicle. So I honestly believe that they had intention to kill everybody there. That they had no warrant, they had no no idea we were there and that uh, we kind of disrupted their whole scheme and that's why everything went awry. Mm. We've kind of thrown the monkey wrench in and that, well, I shouldn't say that. I, I'm going to tell you that the Lord put us there and sure. for this very purpose was to preserve them from being murdered. Sure, sure. Now, um, let's kind of, uh, let's reconstruct uh, the whole the whole uh, convoy, and uh, at least from 
uh, your vehicle and and uh, Ammon Bundy with uh, McConnell in the vehicle behind. Uh, let's reconstruct exactly how that whole thing came about. Uh, you came around, or Lavoie was driving the vehicle, came around a corner, and that's roughly the first uh, first time that you saw any kind of a roadblock ahead. And from what I saw of the uh, forensic film, it was difficult to identify it as a roadblock until the, you almost completely around that curve to see over the snowbank and to see that there actually was a roadblock ahead. And according to the forensics on that, and they have pictures of the taillights coming on in the vehicle, uh, Lavoie was uh, hitting the brakes from uh, right from the time that he saw the uh, road roadblock in place, which was some 450 or 500 feet away. Um, can you kind of get lead through that and how the shots were fired uh, at your vehicle? I I can see all that uh, happening in the film, but I'd like you to uh, kind of talk about it and how all that came down. Well, yes, I can I can talk about it uh, to some extent. We still have a lawsuit pending, so I don't know that I could go into every detail. But let me tell you, um, from where I was sitting. I could not see everything because I had my hand up with my camera and I could not see into the back of my camera. I couldn't see the lens. So I didn't even know everything that it recorded. But I do know when the bullets started flying as they hit the truck um, and we got down, I mean, we were already down, but, um, and LaVoy said that there's a, a, a roadblock. Now, we had just come around, the, we were just making a curve at that time. So he he uh, said there's a roadblock, and then immediately he swings to the left. And at that point, it puts my window directly um, at the roadblock, so I could see them right in my window. Mm-hmm. And then uh, as we came around and, and hit into that snow, we went just a little ways, and then at high center, just stopped right there. and. Right. Um, and then you'll see everything that took place from there. But everything that I actually saw was it was not what was in my camera because I, I was holding the camera the whole time up in the air, even though I slouched down. So I, I had a different perspective from the area I was watching to everything that was on my camera. Okay. Okay. Well, that that's, that's fair, and that's a real honest assessment. Uh, I do know that uh, it was pretty obvious, and there was so little time uh, between when that first shot was fired and ultimately the uh, vehicle ended up stopped and stuck in, in the snowbank on the side of the road. Uh, but there was uh, there were shots fired quite a ways away uh, when that first shot was fired, and it seemed like every time that a shot was fired, uh, Lavoie would lift his foot off the brake just as a reflex, but uh, that he was really trying to break and slow down and get uh, and stop before the uh, before the roadblock. And uh, uh, tell me, just kind of the feeling in the vehicle. Did you guys think they were trying to kill you at the time? Well, well, here's what nobody sees because I didn't turn the camera on until after the first stop. When they stopped us the first time is when they opened fire first at Ryan Payne. Well, I don't know if they knew it was Ryan Payne, but whatever. He threw, We stopped, and he put, threw his arms out the window with both hands open, and immediately we, I saw a laser, and I heard the bullet hit, and he jumped back in. And so they were shooting at us before I even turned on the camera. Wow, okay. And then he so jumps out. So. None of this other stuff happened until after that started. Then, when I said our best defense is our cameras, because I learned that at the Bundy Ranch, and I reached down and picked up my camera and turned it on. It wasn't my cell phone because I was trying to make calls out for help with my cell phone. I so I had my camera running. Yes. Okay. And let then, me say, let me say something sorry. real quick. I talked to Ariel uh, at the at the Lavoie funeral. Now, Ariel is is Ryan Payne's girlfriend, okay? 
and uh, she told me that Ryan had told her that he would have been shot, but the laser hit him in the eye, and that's why he jumped back just before the bullet hit. Now, it hit above his hands by the mirror, and that would have been real close where his head was, okay? Mm-hmm. So they were trying, they were trying to, now, it was supposed to be uh, a, a non-lethal bullet. Well, you shoot somebody in the head with a non-lethal bullet, and that, well, I don't know if it was non-lethal or not, but if you shoot him in the head, there's a good chance that you're going to kill him. I just wanted well, to interject yeah, if, if you hit anybody with a, uh, in the eye with virtually anything, uh, that's straight to the brain. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, so uh, Go, go ahead, uh, uh, Sean, and kind of fill us in then. So that first stop, how far did that occur from the uh, the actual roadblock? Was that uh, a mile or two back? It was about one mile, just barely over a mile. Uh, I know that we were doing at least 60 miles an hour because we were trying to hurry up and get to the sheriff. And so I know we were doing at least 60. And then... Um, as he came around that corner, because he didn't have time to slow down before those bullets started flying. He was just barely breaking to make the corner, just barely, but he was, you know, hurrying to get there, and uh, that's when he saw the roadblock. There was no time for him to stop anyway. And uh, then then as they stopped this, then that's when the bullets continued. You'll hear that in my video, and the mm-hmm. – and, yeah. The, the bullets continued to fly. There was no way for us to get out. They had actually um, shot, and, and you can't see that, but you can hear all this stuff that's happening. And mm-hmm. the windows are breaking, and um, the first shots come through, and and immediately I see lasers every place. Right. Well, we all do. And um, LaVoy's running through the snow, of course, and... Uh, well, I don't know how you can run through three and a half to four feet of snow, but he's, yeah, he's yeah. trying to, okay, um, and to draw the fire away. But we have we have uh, Ryan, who is shot. Uh, he doesn't say anything right off the bat, but he, in a minute he says he's shot. But uh, but I was trying to uh, what protect people because of the laser. I was worried about Victoria number one, and I and I was I I can see the laser on her leg, on her knee. I mean. All over the place, and so I'm pushing their, I'm pushing their legs. I'm shoving his head down because I could see it on his hat. I was really worried because I could just picture in my mind what was going to happen, you know, because I just sure. heard the bullet hit the mirror right after the laser. So I don't know when they're going to pull that trigger, but I, I'm really ticked off because as they break the window and these other things, uh, and you know the glass is flying, we don't know what's happening on the outside as much. I mean, we're trying to. You can hear my camera, definitely. And you can hear the shots. When they said there wasn't all those shots, you know, three shots, six shots, whatever they were saying, that is not true. That is absolutely not true. Yeah. And so you can hear them. And the other thing that you can uh, see, not to interrupt you, but uh, the thing that you can uh, see on the video is is that uh, in spite of the fact that they said they – were talking the whole time, telling you the occupants of the vehicle to get out with your hands up and all that. There was none of that going on. They were shooting, and they weren't uh, trying to get anyone out of the vehicle. That's how we know that they were. We knew for sure they were trying to kill us all. We knew that. And and But the bullets that were hitting the window by my head were just bouncing, were bouncing off. And I'm telling you, we were. Just, I was just praying and praying. And that's what was uh, amazing to me is because I felt like the Lord was just protecting me in that window. And every time I had a hit, I just knew, you know, that he was deflecting them. It was because they were breaking out all the windows, and then they started shooting in all the gas, all the, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if it's pepper spray, OC gas, whatever the heck it is. All we, all we know is it was just coming in, you know, like crazy. And so, so definitely... In my heart, and both of us, we knew, and all of us, we knew that they were trying to kill us. It had to, and it didn't have anything to do with uh, trying to let us get out or help us get out or anything. There was nothing, and it went on for a long time. So and to support and to support what Shauna is saying, 
uh, I was up there uh, last Father's Day for the, at the memorial site there, and there were some other people that had been there for a while, and they sh- they took me around, and they showed me all the fresh cut branches, and there was a lot of them, uh, where they had set up platforms and shooting lanes. This thing was had been preconceived, and you know it was cold blooded, calculated murder. That's what that was. Well, I think that's pretty obvious on that forensic film, but I I do want our listeners to go to that site for themselves, to see it for themselves, because, uh, uh, frankly, there's still going to be a lot of uh, people that are going to poo-poo this and say, oh, it's just, you know, uh, uh, your perspective. Well, go to the forensic file on that, and I think it's pretty... uh, pretty self-explanatory. I think anybody with a, uh, a rational uh, idea of what happens in uh, in a crime scene will have a pretty good idea of just exactly how that came down. Um, well, a lot of people Sean, are I mental cowards. Ask, a lot of people are mental cowards. A lot of people More are mental cowards. Mental cowards. Yeah. And they don't want to know the truth. The very definition of Stockholm Syndrome, because when you know the truth, you got to start making decisions. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, Sean, I wanted you to mention when when you finally got out of the vehicle, because they pumped some rounds through there and the gas and everything else, what you saw uh, with the uh, uh, people that were at the site that were uh, FBI or military, they were dressed like military, they weren't properly... Uh, identifying themselves, but also all the people in the trees and and all the uh, things that you saw when you actually got out of the vehicle. Well, I've said it many times now. When I got out of the vehicle, I saw men who had come out, stepped out from behind the trees, and they were dressed in, like, military uniforms with, you know, uh, there was there was no uh, name tags on the ones that I saw. As I saw them up closer, I asked them why they put me in uh, handcuffs. If I was under arrest, they told me no, I was being detained, and I they didn't know why. They told me they didn't know why. Um, they had no name tags on. They had, um, I, I mean, one of them had a hat on with the track like a pro cam, but there was no camera on it. I asked him, "Where's your camera?" And uh, he made light of it, and and uh, and never answered that. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, I saw no cameras. I saw no ni- names. I saw no um, police vehicles. I saw nothing that indicated that that's what they were. Who they were. Wow. So, well, um, what, what about the people in the uh, surrounding? You said there were quite a few more than uh, than were identified. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it looked like a, uh, like I was in a war zone. There's probably at least a dozen or more of people, of men, who had come down out of the trees and stepped out from behind them. And that was that was crazy. You don't see that in any video either because another this is after I shut it off. Another important thing to bring out is that Ryan Bundy uh, took a, he took a round in the shoulder. And it went through the top of the vehicle. It penetrated the top of his shoulder and is now lodged just above the elbow. It is a 308 caliber bullet. That is an FBI round. That's a, that's one of their sniper rounds. Oregon State Police were shooting 5.65s. That is why they have beat him up so badly in prison, trying to get that evidence and destroy that evidence. Um, also, you heard that uh, there, there are certain um, FBI agents who were under indictment, and we've heard nothing about that. But they were the ones that tried to hide evidence, and they got caught hiding the evidence, uh, namely the, uh, the rounds that they were firing, which were brass-colored or copper-colored, where the Oregon State Police were shooting um, silver. Their brass was silver. And they got caught trying to hide that evidence. So it is very obvious, very obvious to me, that these this HRT, HR team, HRT team, I guess it is, mm-hmm. they were out there to assassinate people. Uh, I think they tried to kill 
I think they tried to kill Ryan Bundy in the vehicle, and they, and I believe very strongly that some of those, at least one of those rounds that hit LeBoy was from the the FBI snipers, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, not not Lavoie. You're talking uh, Ryan, right? I I'm saying Lavoie also. I you know we have not seen the official um, the official uh, what do you call it uh, of his body. Uh, okay. We only got what the government put out. All right. Right. We know he took three rounds in the back, and yeah. uh, and and uh, incidentally, uh, although you weren't. Uh, able to actually film this, uh, Shauna, the the uh, FBI footage or the overhead footage shows clearly that someone uh, from around the back of the vehicle fired a shot at uh, Lavoie, and at that point he grabs for his chest, and that's when they uh, shot him three times in the back. Um, I have seen I have seen that forensic, yes. The, yeah, the, the that, person who did it he was, he was with a silver, uh, silver, a uh, rubber bullet, uh, and that it hit him in the chest. And when he grabbed for his chest, which is a, a natural reflex, then they said, well, he was reaching for a gun. Um, can you, uh, first of all, he wasn't, he wasn't carrying a firearm with him. Am, am, am I correct on that? He, he disarmed before he left for the meeting. That's right. And I also heard that the uh, police investigators uh, rifled through the uh, uh, Malheur uh, facility there looking for uh, his uh, handgun, which he was uh, famous for carrying, and uh, that someone had uh, taken it and and gotten it out of the facility before they got there, and uh, that they, you know, that they were looking for it so they could. Um, put it on his body. Uh, am, am, am I correct with that too? I believe that. I believe they were, but uh, it was it was already taken. Yes, it was not in the in the facility uh, when they came looking for it. Was what I was told. So, well, this is uh, this is an absolutely tragic and amazing story. Um, I, I we're running toward the end of our program here, but I really want to uh, thank you both for uh, having the the guts to come forward and talk about this, and uh, I also want to mention, um, uh, Shauna, do you want to mention the book that you wrote that uh, I did not get on our our, uh, billboard for this week's program, but uh, apparently you wrote uh, a book, uh, The Last Rancher Standing, and uh, you're welcome to uh, promote that a little bit while while we've got a minute. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I did write a book. It was uh, about what happened at the Bundy Ranch, probably the precursor to this whole thing. But it was uh, in 2000, November 2014, I put out the book because the Lord asked me to write a He told me to write a book. And I needed to because it testifies of all the miracles that took place then. And it's the story of what happened. And I think that will help people understand the the reasons why some of this happened now uh, in in Oregon. It's, and um, it, you can find it on Amazon probably. I haven't really promoted it a lot, but I really think we need to because we need to get that money and, and – start using it for the legal defenses that we set it up for and that we were able to write it for in the first place. So it's, it's about, um, it will, it will just help the American people to understand the things that have been taking place and the things that are still taking place. And we have a responsibility to stop it. Well, and I, um, while, while we're talking about it, I want to uh, mention the fact that uh, Lavoy wrote a book uh, and I've recently read that book. It's actually pretty well written, um, uh, but it's called Only Bly- by Blood and Suffering, uh, Regaining Lost Freedom. And that book is available on uh, also on Amazon or through the family. And the proceeds of that book are being used to uh, help support the Finicum family. And I would uh, suggest that it would be good for our listeners to order both of these books and try to support the people that are 
standing up for private property in the western United States and we're all facing the same demon here and I've I've uh, uh, been involved with the anti agenda 21 movement for quite a long time and I can tell people that uh, uh, sustainable development and uh, UN agenda 21 and 2030 are at the very heart of this uh, attack on private property an attack on ranching families in the western US because we oh. are literally the last uh the last hope uh for private property in the west and once they get rid of the ranchers and the farmers that are here and turn this whole country or the whole western part of the country into wilderness uh we will no longer uh, have the freedom and our country will literally be uh mega cities with uh uh, uh, very, very many people living in a very small, confined area, and we will be living in a totally different country than anything we could have ever envisioned. So, oh, uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, That's been my drum for the. I've been beating the Agenda 21 drum for many years, and I am so glad that you, you guys are on board and that you understand that. And what a great audience. Yeah, well, we do. We've got a, a very bright audience, and we've got a very, uh, uh, let's say, a very patriotic audience. And I think that uh, the fact that we're trying to present the kind of information we are through guests like yourselves, uh, it, it really is the sort of thing that Americans need to hear. They need to understand. We have a wonderful country. We have a lot of uh, people in federal government that are good people. Uh, don't take yeah. this to uh, paint the entire uh, picture as black because the fact is, is I've got good friends in the BLM and other uh, federal agencies that are just about as patriotic as we are. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, there's a few rotten apples that have bought on to this insanity of this uh, global governance thing and uh, the uh, UN Agenda 21, and they're, they're the ones that are promoting this entire thing that is so antithetical to the U.S. Constitution and what our country was founded on. So, uh, uh, Shauna, I want to thank you, and uh, is there anything else you would like to say? And then I'd like to give Brand the same. Oh, only I, I only want to say please keep praying for all those that are still incarcerated and for this country. Uh, the Lord, if we don't repent, we we won't be able to save it. But we know that we've seen miracles, and we're going to have more miracles, and only through the faith and the repentance of American people, because it's only for moral people. So please, please continue those prayers. We we need all the help we can get. Well, thank you for that. And Brand, do you have anything you'd like to mention? Well, I'd just like to concur with what Shauna just said. I'd also like to say, uh, you know, to the uh, to the assassin, the assassin that killed the boy, that was the most cowardly act. It's hard to even put it into words, but it was the most cowardly act of the blackest die. And I will see you before the judgment bar of God. So help me, God. Well, and that's the the one. Uh really marvelous thing that we have as Christians that we have to fall back on is the fact that the Lord is the one who will make the ultimate judgment. And uh, a lot of things can happen, but as long as we uh, do what we believe is a godly uh, Christian thing, then uh, we will be protected because ultimately, uh, even if they uh, physically terminate our existence. They cannot do that uh, spiritually. So, uh, Amen. Well, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us uh, today for uh, another uh, another program in connecting the dots. 